which he has entitled the sermon, How Jesus Wants Us to Love Him. Thank you, David. Good morning, everybody. And uh, the children can go with Angela now. Let me take this off. Praises be to God. What a, what a joy it is to, to be with you again and to, to share the Word of God. Amen. How Jesus wants us to love Him. Isn't that a very important question? Yeah. Or is that a statement? Let's question. look at the, um, the verse today is in John 21, verses 15 to 17. And you'll notice, as you see on the PowerPoint, that I've put two different words for love up there. Because in the Bible, it uses different words for love. And, yeah, yeah. and in this, this passage of scripture we're going to look at, we'll see one word, agapo, and it means to love unconditionally and sacrificially as God himself loves sinful men and the way he loves the Son. It's actually the verb of agape. And then we see another word in this passage, phileo, and it's brotherly love. And it's a generous and affectionate love. I have included uh, in the passage that I've put up there for you, and I'm not saying don't turn to it in your Bible, it's nice to turn to it in your Bible as well, but I've included in this those different Greek words <coughs> for love, just so that you're aware yeah. of them, and that you're aware that I'm aware of them. Because I don't believe today that the key point in these verses is actually whether Peter loved Jesus. As strange as that might sound when Jesus asked Peter, Three times, do you love me, do you love me, do you love me? Um, rather, I believe the key point, and I hope you might see this today, the key point in this passage is that how Jesus wanted Peter to express his love toward him. So that's what I'm going to major on today, and I, I hope that as we go through it, perhaps you'll see why I'm hesitant to make... Uh, to place any great significance on those two different Greek words for love in, in the passage. But let's read it. Let's just read that passage. John 21. So this is part three of this series on John 21. And I'll just read from verse 15. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these. Do you agapa me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you, phileo you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him again, a, a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved. Jesus, um, Peter was grieved. He, he said, because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Before we look at how Jesus wanted Peter to love him and how Jesus wants us to love him, let's notice the love of Christ here. Let's notice the love of Christ toward Peter in this passage. Because the Bible says we love him, why? Because he, he first loved us. So let's notice the love of Jesus in this passage for Peter. Remember the, the earlier reading today and, and about 
the Peter's denial of Jesus. Remember the, the video that you saw about Peter's denial of Jesus, how Peter denied Jesus three times. And in Mark's version of, of this story, it says Peter, he, um, he cursed and he swore, I do not know the man. And, and, and so we see something really amazing in this text today about the love of God. Isn't it amazing that as we read there that Jesus has something very important for Peter. He has an important place for Peter to a place of leadership, a, a place of pastoring and shepherding the sheep. And he, but, but Peter had denied him three times and swore, I do not know the man. But isn't this amazing, the forgiveness that we see toward Peter from Jesus? That he would, Jesus would go to that extent to place this great responsibility on Peter. This is true forgiveness. When somebody has wronged you, when somebody has shown that really that they're not trustworthy, and yet you give them this full forgiveness and restoration. It reminds me of, does it remind any of you of the story of the prodigal son? And the forgiveness of that father and the restoration that the, the father uh, gave the prodigal son who had gone away and had wasted his father's goods on, on, on bad living, righteous living. And yet that young man, that he was fully restored, he was given the... Um, the, the sandals, and, and that, that was really, that was probably a sign of sonship because it was the slaves who worked without sandals on bare feet. He was given the signet ring, which is probably a sign of authority. The father had given him back authority, and he was given the best robe. Honor was shown in the restoration of that son. So this is a story of true love and true <coughs> forgiveness that we see Jesus offering to Peter here for us if we've messed up. If, if, if we have uh, messed up with, with Christ as, as Peter had messed up with Christ, let us know that Jesus still has an important place for us if we repent, if we've turned back to him, if we still love him like Peter loved him, Jesus still has a place for us. There's the encouragement from this story so far for us, but now here's the first challenge for us today. The first challenge is this, the Bible says that we are to walk as Christ walked. The Bible says that we are to walk in His steps. So is there anyone here who, who's messed up with you, like Peter messed up with Christ? Is there anybody here who has wronged you, as Peter had wronged Christ? Is there somebody who's treated you badly, who, who wants you to forgive them. And, and let's say you have forgiven them. But have you forgiven them to the extent of being willing to trust them again? There's a big question for us today. Is there somebody we say we're forgiven, but yet we're failing to put that pure trust in them as we see that Jesus put in Peter, the man that denied him, Three times. I've got three more important questions for us today that come from this passage. And, and one, the first one is, do you love Jesus? The second question is, um, if you love Jesus, how does Jesus want you to express that love? And the third question for today is, are you expressing your love for Jesus in that way that He wants you to. So let's look at verse 15 again. 
And I'll read it again. It says, So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. So I ask you a question. I want maybe I want an answer here. I ask you a question. Did Jesus know how Peter loved him? Did Peter know how Jesus loved him? Yes. yes. Why? Yeah. Jesus knows people's hearts and he knows people's minds. Also, it wasn't very hard to, uh, to know Peter's heart or to know Peter's mind, was it? Why? Because Peter, he was a, a man who just showed his, his affections quite freely. Peter's love for Jesus was yeah. clearly evident. As, as we saw last time, it was clearly evident by his actions. Can anyone remember how when the disciples were in the boat and they, uh, they John, he, he recognized it was Jesus on the shore. Yeah. And as soon as Peter knew it was Jesus, he did not hesitate. He took off his clothes and he dived into the water because he wanted to be with Jesus. And he was there first. Yeah. And then when Jesus asked him, bring, bring some fish that you have caught. And who was it that immediately went, pulled the net in and grabbed the fish? Yes, it was Peter. Yeah. Is our love for Christ clearly evident? as Peter's love was. Is the degree of our love for Christ clearly evident as, as Peter's love was? A third reason why I, I believe Jesus knew how, how much Peter loved him is because why would Jesus entrust Peter with that important responsibility of shepherding his people? His flock. Yeah. If, if he knew Jesus, Peter didn't have the required degree of love. Okay. Jesus knew yeah. that Peter okay. was capable. He had the love yeah. to be entrusted with, with this important yeah. role. Mm. And fourthly, we see in verses 15 to 17, the same Peter... Although Jesus interestingly <coughs> refers to him uh, with his old name, Simon, son of Jonah. Uh, but we, we see here, interestingly, that Peter, he, he responds immediately to Jesus' question, do you love me, with a yes. And, and three times, no hesitation, yes, I love you, Jesus. So yes, we know that Jesus understood how much Peter loved him. So why did <laughs> why did Jesus even ask the question and ask it three times? Do you love me, Peter? And do you love me more than these? And and we'll look at that more than these part in a minute. Um, I believe Jesus asked. The question of Peter, do you love me? Because the key issue Jesus is raising with, with Peter here is not whether he loves him or how much he loves him, but how Jesus wants him to love. express his love. His love. And, and I think we could, we could probably read it. <laughs> Jesus is saying this, do yeah. you love me more than these? Then tend my lambs. Do you love me more than these? Then Feed my sheep. I think we can agree that Jesus um, knew how much Peter loved him and he was emphasizing how he wanted Peter to express that love. Of course, as verse 17 says, as you see verse 17, um, we'll go back there. Peter was grieved. He was upset that Jesus asked him three times whether he loved him. We can understand that. Um, is there any married couple here? I think there's only one. Can I, can I borrow a married couple here for a second, Scott and Cheryl? And I want to ask Cheryl if you could ask 
Scott, do you love me? Then you have to say, yes, you know I love you, darling. And then you say, love our children. And I want you to do it three times, Cheryl. I'll just run that by you again. So you say, do you love me? Scott says, yes, you know I love you. And then you say, love our children. Can, can you do that? Yes, you know I love you. Thank you. Yes, we can understand why Peter was grieved, but he was also a little confused why this question was even being repeated. So he kept repeating, you know I love you. You know I love you. You know all things. You know I love you. But Peter didn't seem to be confused about the, do you love me more than these part? If I said to you, do you love me more than these? More than what? So, so um, I'm suggesting that when Jesus said to Peter, do you love me more than these, that Peter must have, Jesus must have pointed at something. So, so Peter understood what the more, more than these meant. Many think that these, that Jesus probably pointed to, were the fish, were, were the great fish that had been caught, that represented the, the past life that, that Peter lived and made a livelihood from. And I believe that's quite possible, because if you read the preceding verses, that huge catch of 153 large fish, it was a major part of the reading leading up to this Jesus question of, of Peter. Whilst I explained in my earlier sermons that I don't believe Peter had gone back to the fishing business, we know that things from our life before we became Christians are tempting to us. It's always tempting to go back and do the things that you gave up before you became a Christian, the things that you, you loved. And, and we have to watch out for that. Peter had to watch out for that. We made a decision to follow Christ and to give up certain things in our lives that, that do not please God or, or that we're giving too much attention to when we need to give our attention to following Jesus and loving Jesus. And so Peter had to watch that and we have to watch that. Jesus here was calling Peter to be a pastor and a, a leader of his people. And in verse 19, he said, he called him, follow me. And then he repeated that as well in verse 22. You follow me. He wouldn't have, wouldn't have time for any fishing business. Not with this kind of call that God had put on his life. Because Jesus wanted him to shepherd his sheep. What a calling that, that he had. Some think uh, the, uh, Jesus was pointing, instead of at the fish, some think when, when Jesus said, do you love me more than these, some think Jesus was pointing at the other disciples. And I, I can kind of understand that as well, as a possibility. Because who was the one showing all the love, looking like he loved uh, Jesus more than the others? Wasn't it Peter, the one who, who dived out of the boat, wanted to be with Jesus really fast? When Jesus said, bring some of the fish you've caught, who was it that immediately grabbed the fish? Peter, do you love me more than these? Well, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. I can understand if that's... Who, what do you think? Who thinks it was the fish he was told to love me more than these in the fishing business? Hands up. Who thinks it was... Do you love me more than these meant the other disciples? Got some there? Who think there's something else? Alright, it's one of those two by the, by the look of it. But, actually for Peter, and for us, 
it doesn't really matter what the more than these is. Do you love me more than these? It doesn't really matter because actually Jesus said we're to love him more than anything, more than our lives. As, as we see in John 12, 25, he who loves his life will lose it. Do you love Jesus more than your life? And, and Jesus also said in Matthew 10, 37, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves even son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Do you love your ch Jesus more than your children? Do you love Jesus more than your mother, than your father, than your... This is, this is what is really important here. So the question for us, let's ask it three times. Just as Peter was asked it three times. Do you love Jesus? Do you love Jesus? Do you love Jesus? The next important question for us today is how does Jesus want us to express our love for him? How did Jesus want Peter to express his love toward him? Well, he gave Peter a, a command to feed my sheep, tend my sheep, and follow me. Jesus wanted Peter to express his love by obeying those commands that he gave him. Now, how does Jesus want us, how does God want us to love him? Well, I'm not going to give you my opinion today. I'm just going to read the scriptures. And I'm going to find them in my Bible, and they're on the screen. I might have some time for you to read them and let them soak into you as, as I find them in my Bible. The first one, how God and Jesus want us to love him. Mark 12, 30. Mark 12 and verse 30 says, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. How does Jesus want us to love him? How does God want us to love him? With all your mind. our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. Is that how we're loving him? The next verse that shows, tells us is 1 John. Let's turn to 1 John 4, 20 to 21. I'll just read it on the screen if, if you like. It says, If someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. Isn't that important to God? If we're going to love God, we have to love our brother. We need to love our neighbor as ourselves, which is okay. the second command. And we're to love the brethren, especially the household of faith, we're told in another scripture. The next one, how God and Jesus want us to love them, Hebrews 6.10. And it says, For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. Your labor of love for God, we see in this verse, is your ministering to the saints. Isn't that what uh, Jesus was asking, was, was saying to Peter? If you love me, minister to the sheep. Do we love Jesus as he wants us to love him? Do we love God as he wants us to love him? Let's have a look at another Verse 2 John 6. John has a lot to say, doesn't he, about yeah, yeah. loving Jesus. We'll see in a minute. So much. John 6, 1 John 1, 6 says, This is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. 
Next one. John 14, 15, the words of Jesus. And it says there, If you love me, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, 23 says, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. What a wonderful, what a wonderful promise. Mm. Mm. Pray that we are all experiencing that promise. Having the Father and the Son make, having made their home in us by the Holy Spirit. If that's not your reality in life, it can be. What an awesome reality, having the Father and the Son through the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. <coughs> Next one, Jesus again, he says in John 15, 10, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Next one, 1 John 5, 3, it says... For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not burdensome. There's a bit of a theme going on here, isn't it? It's very, very repetitive. 1 John 2, 4 and 5. And I'm happy to take these slowly because I'd like it to... To sink into us so we never forget or make up our own ideas of how Jesus, how God wants us to love them. 1 John 2, 4 and 5 says, He who says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. 1 Corinthians 7.19 says, Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. But keeping the commandments of God is what matters. Finally, Revelation 14, 12. Revelation 14, 12. I think I know this one. But I'm going to read it. And it says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And the faith of Jesus. Does God really mean... We're to show our love for Him by keeping His laws? Yes, but that's legalism, like somebody might say. No, I just read the pure, unadulterated word. I just read the scriptures. It's not legalism. The problem is, if you think it's legalism, is, is that Christians have been confused by some who have come into the church and have turned the grace of God into license to do the things that please them, just like we see in, in Jude, Jude 4. It was happening there, then already in the New Testament church, Jude 4, and I've got it in the Amplified Version. It says, for certain people have crept in unnoticed, just as if they were sneaking in by a side door. They are ungodly persons whose condemnation was predicted long ago, for they distort the grace of our God into decadence, living in a rich uh, lifestyle, and immoral freedom, viewing it as an opportunity to do whatever they want. Viewing the grace of God as an opportunity to do whatever they want, and deny and disown our Master and 
the Lord Jesus Christ. What we need to remember, brethren, about the law of God is seen in the following scriptures. We need to remember that the law of God is useless in a very important sense. The law of God is useless as a way of making us right before God, as a way of justifying us before God. Keeping the laws, we're, not, we're saved by grace through faith, not of works, not of keeping the law. These verses tell us quite plainly that the law of God, we, we, no one can be justified by, by doing it. Let's read Romans 3, 28 to 31. I'll just turn there. We need to know this, and I'm sure we do. Romans 3, 28 says, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith, apart from the deeds of the law. And we see in verse 31, it says, Though do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. So as you go through the New Testament, you'll see some things that sound a bit negative about the law of God because it's talking about the thing that the law of God can't do. And then we'll see some things about the law of God that are quite positive. But let's look at this a couple more. Galatians 2, 16. And it, it tells us plainly that the law can't... We can't be justified by keeping the law of God. Galatians 2, verse uh, 16 says... Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Thank you, God, that we're justified not by oh, all of our so-called goodness, but we're justified by faith. We can all have faith, can't we? We can have true faith in God. And then we see Romans 3.20. And that says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. So I'm, it's repeating here, but we need to understand that. It's not our good works. We cannot say, I'm a good person, and therefore, I, you should let me in, God, into heaven, because I'm a good person. It's not our works. Don't. But look at the transition in this verse, the second part, it says after that, it says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So now we're just going to see some useful and beneficial things that, and, that, and good things that the Apostle Paul says about the law of God after saying, well, it can't help us to... Um, they just can't justify us keeping it. But here's some useful things, some good things, some beneficial things we should remember. And hence why we heard all of these verses. How do we love Jesus? How do we love God? Keep His commandments. This is the love of God. Keep His commandments. Keep His commandments. And so let's look at that. By the law is the knowledge of sin. It's important that we know what sin is, isn't it? Because... Many people want to make it up in their own minds. Oh, that's not sin. Oh, this is sin. And as human beings, we have a tendency to define sin in the way that suits the way we live, don't we? But it says here that by the law is the knowledge of sin. We read in Romans 7, Apostle Paul again, he said, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, You shall not covet. I think it's interesting you chose that example from the Ten Commandments because uh, a lot of people might not naturally think that coveting is, is a wrong thing to do. And so I, it's interesting he chose that one from the Ten Commandments because if he had have chosen murder, it wouldn't have made sense. We all know that murder is wrong, but a lot of people might not know that coveting is wrong. So by mm. the law, we know, yeah. we have knowledge of sin. Another thing, some other things that 
the Apostle Paul said that were positive about the law of God, after saying the things it can't do, we see in Romans 7 as well. Romans 7 verse 12 says, Therefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Verse 14 is interesting. For we know that the law is spiritual. The law is spiritual. And remember later on in Romans 8, he says, if we want to overcome the, the, the flesh and, and the, the, the sinful lust in our life, Apostle Paul says um, that we must um, put our mind onto spiritual, set our minds on spiritual things. And not on fleshly things. And we'll, we'll win in that battle of the flesh versus the spirit when we set our mind on spiritual things. And what did he say was spiritual here? The law is spiritual. And then we see in verse 22, Paul's relationship to the law of God. He says in verse 22, For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. That was his delight. He delighted in it. Just like we see King David in Psalm 119 over and over again. He says how much he loves God's law. And then finally, verse 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so that with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. He was in the same battle we are in of the flesh versus the spirit. But in the next chapter, read the next chapter, he, he tells us, as I said before, that thanks be to God who gives me the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Set your mind on the things of the spirit, not on the things of the flesh. You will overcome. You will overcome and you will walk in the way that God wants us to walk. Back to Peter. So Jesus gave Peter... When, when, whom he knew loved him, Jesus gave Peter, whom he knew loved him, he gave him commands to feed his sheep and to follow him. And, and we know that Peter did that. And, and, and we know that Peter did that even knowing that at that very time, let's look at the verse, let's turn to John 22, I don't have that on the screen, at the time that Jesus said to Peter, you follow me, you follow me, you feed my sheep. Jesus said to him, this is how you're going to die as a result of doing this. And, and so we read in John 21 and uh, verse um, 18. Most assuredly I say to you, when you were younger... You girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. What does that remind you of? How is he going to die? Crucifixion. Carried on in the way that Jesus was carried on that cross. And Peter, this is, one, this is another reason why I believe that I don't make a big deal of whether Peter phileoed or agape, agape uh, Jesus, because at this moment, Peter was obedient. He accepted Jesus' command, even when Jesus said to him, you are going to die by following me. But Peter said, yes, and we know Peter's life. He, he did indeed. He had the love. He had the power of the Holy Spirit. He was filled with love of the Spirit, and he did serve Jesus till his death. And that wasn't a very that was wasn't a short time. He endured a long time before he did die as a martyr for Jesus Christ. So we have three questions for us today. As I say, Carl, close. The first question was: Do we need to show somebody who we have forgiven? that we have really forgiven them by showing them that we also trust them now. Is that the depth of our forgiveness for them, that we will trust them? The second question we had today was, 
do I love Jesus? Do I love Him more than anything? The third question was, if we do love Jesus, how does He want us to love Him? And we heard that it, it was by love Him, by loving the brethren, minister to the saints. We, we heard that we were to love Him with all of our hearts, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength. And we also heard that loving God and loving Jesus, we will keep His commandments. We will keep His word if we love Him. And then the final question was, are we? Are we ministering to the saints? Do we love God with all of our heart? Do we love Jesus with all of our soul and mind and strength? And are we keeping His commandments? Are we keeping His word? If we can say yes, then we love. We really do love God. If you love God, if you love God, if somebody here, if you love God and, and you are convicted by hearing this word today, if you are convicted in your heart that I am not loving Him in the way that He wants to be loved by keeping His commandments, then please come down the front right now and let's pray for you. If you do love God, but you know, know after hearing what you've heard today in the scriptures that you're not loving Him as He wants you to love Him, come down the front now and we're going to pray. Pray for you. Shall I make that call three times? Just because this is a three times sermon, isn't it? If you love God and you're convicted by this message today that you are not loving God in the way that He wants you to love Him, by keeping His commandments, by serving and ministering to the saints with all your heart, mind, soul and strength. Just come forward and let's pray. pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Anybody else want to come forward? I don't make older calls normally. <laughs> this, is, this is the first older call I've made in a long time. And then maybe... Who knows when the next one is? Well, come in. Thank come you. In. Let's let's have a prayer. And uh, Brother Rich, would you like to make the prayer, or shall I? Thank you. Praise God. Sorry, Rich. Thank you. Well, we're just gonna um, let's 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 kneel if you can kneel or, or bow your heads, and Rich is gonna pray. Yeah, but when, when one person loves another, they get to know one another. When, when person A loves person B, person A will make an effort to find out what person B likes, will make an effort to, to find out what pleases person B, will make an effort to find out what displeases person B, and will endeavour to work with person B to, to build up person B and to help the dreams and desires of person B to, to reach fulfilment. And one of the things that we can so easily do is be apathetic um, when it comes to, to pleasing you. And to, I ask that you help us all to grow in our understanding of, of what you like, of what you desire, of what pleases you and what displeases you. May we choose more and more and more often to
put away the desires of the flesh and to focus on the spiritual. We've been told your Torah, your commands are spiritual. We're told that they don't save us, but we're told that they please you. And Yeshua has reiterated that if we love him, we are loving you. And if we love him, we will obey your commands. Given before Yeshua came and given after Yeshua came through him and through the apostles and through what was written in your word. May we enrich ourselves may by being enriched through your word. May we spend more time in your word or disciplined, a disciplined amount of time in, you, in your word. May we be your disciples, your disciplined ones. And may we choose to fellowship with one another, even when it can seem inconvenient at times. And may we help one another grow. Some people think that that, that ministry is an official title, and sometimes it can be, but it's not always that. When people come to mind, may we not just think, oh yeah, but this person come to mind, may we actually pray for them. And may we have hearts of forgiveness. May we even be willing to forgive to the point of trusting, even if we've been betrayed or let down or we know that the other person is still struggling with hatred towards us or something like that. Help us to know how to navigate those times and those situations. May we somehow be strengthened in our love and may we truth in love. May, may your truth live in us to the extent that we love as an outworking of your truth in us. May we truth and love. And may we live lives worthy of your calling. May we choose the path of purity. May we, may we choose well in terms of what we eat, both physically, so we're protecting this, this, this tent, this tabernacle that you've given us in the short term, and also spiritually. Something that stood out to me today was the loving more, loving Yeshua more. It didn't matter if Yeshua was saying, do you love me more than these fish, your source of livelihood and sense of security? Or do you love me more than these friends and close associates and people every one of whom has made a difference in your life and who's significant to you. Whatever it is, we're to love you more. Please help us to understand what it means to, to be willing to sacrifice everything. To lay down everything. To truly bow down and worship. Not just, not just on Shabbat, not just on 
special days, but every day, mm -hmm. and in every relationship, mm -hmm. and in every um, career or job, in every interaction with with every institution and every other person. Please help us to remember our our, our brethren, our, our fellow believers in you who are being tortured and, and are enslaved and who are being lied to and deceived. and who are in prison. I ask that you guide each of us individually in this, in this um, aspect of our walk. But we can't all go and meet with prisoners. We can't all send a million dollars in aid or things like that. But we can all pray, and I ask that you be willing, that you help us to be willing to be courageous and willing to step forward in the obedience of faith. When you call us to action, may we act in faith. May the love that we have for you grow. May all of the fruit of your satisfaction set apart spirit grow in us and may others know that we are your disciples because of the love that we have for one another and we know that the love that we have from one another grows as we love you more and more and grow in your word live our lives according to your instruction thank you for this time together this morning. Thank you for, for reminding us of the riches that we have in you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for reminding us that when the son who had disrespected his father and gone and wasted so much of the potential of his life came back to you, there was full forgiveness and there was rejoicing and there was that intimate intimacy and relationship. Thank you.